So uh, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me. So my talk's a little bit different, and I, I come from a little bit different background, so much more of a technical background. And so uh, for that reason, my list of disclaimers uh, is a little bit higher because we, we, we take money from everyone. Um, <laughs> but, but, but there we go. Um, so the work that we're doing is thinking about how we can use computer models and simulation that we've seen in lots of fields of engineering and apply those to cardiology. So when we think about making mathematical models of the heart, we're looking at first how we can simulate things about electrical activation, modeling the propagation of activation across the myocardium. But this goes further, so we're now also including things about the electrophysiology in the cells. We're able to capture the dynamics of the proteins in the cell membranes, such as the potassium channels, sodium channels, uh, and calcium channels that are bringing ions in and out of the cell and regulating electrophysiology. We can go one further and then link down from these ion channels through to the calcium dynamics where we can capture the dynamics of ryanine receptor or circa, characterizing how calcium is moving in and out of the cycloplasm reticulum. That's working eventually. And then how that links through to the sarcomere, capturing the dynamics of troponin, tropomyosin, the uh, actin filaments and, and the myosin filaments to generate tension uh, within the cell, within the sarcomeres. And we can then link this through and start to then think how that will link through to the whole heart, the anatomy, and how that will give rise to mechanics. So this provides a way of providing a quantitative framework for going from electrophysiology all the way through to the whole heart uh, pump function. But we also know from work that we've been doing, um, particularly in things like uh, uh, cardiotoxicity, that we need to include elements of the mitochondria, which is going to be providing the ATP for all of these different components. We have mathematical representations of the fibrotic structure, so the collagen, the density, and its orientation, and how that varies across the heart. And more recently, we've been looking at how we can include omics data from mass spectrometry or mRNA data, so we can characterize how changes in protein dynamics are going to be affecting the cardiac function. So our goal here is really to provide a complete end-to-end -end framework which allows us to bring in whatever data our, our basic scientists or our clinical colleagues come to us with to be able to address any problem that they have uh, of interest. And so I wanted to talk about how we can apply this uh, to, to cardiac synchronization therapy. So all of our models start with uh, an anatomy, and because uh, I have engineers and not clinical fellows, uh, they will refuse to work with anything but high-quality images, so we do everything on cardiac CT, or predominantly cardiac CT. Uh, no one will work with echo. We convert these segmentations through to meshes, uh, and then from these we can then generate virtual cohorts where we're able to capture some of the variability that we see in patients in virtual patient cohorts. We can then project the fibres that we measure from diffusion tensor MRI in the atria uh, and work with Johns Hopkins and also from histology studies and DTMRI uh, in the ventricles to give us four chamber fibre orientations. We can capture the preferential orientation of the muscle, how that affects the passive mechanics, how it affects the active mechanics and the electrophysiology. We can then incorporate this within our models to give a bit of a bigger picture for simulating electrical activation and then we can use this to drive our models of mechanics where we get our whole organ pump function including the effects of the pericardium constraining the left and right ventricles. So most of our work we do is focused on the adult population but I wanted to kind of give an example of how we could use this technology in uh, congenital heart disease and one of the questions that we had that was posed to us by one of our colleagues at the Brompton, um, Sonia uh, Babanarayan, was uh, how could we simulate uh, CRT in uh, tetralogy of, or repaired tetralogy of fallop patients. And so for these, we can get an MRI, and they have great MRI at the Brompton. And so we can look at what are the different possible lead locations that we might want to put into one of these patients. So we can do this just in the MRI, non-invasively, uh, and we can have a conversation with the cardiologist about where we might want to put these different leads. So we might want to put an RV reflect, RVOT, right ventricular outflow tract, uh, RV posterior wall, RV lateral wall. We can include the effects of the septal patch of, uh, of a, from the repair, as well as the RVOT patch. We can also include the effects of infarcts or different uh, changes in electrophysiology for these patients. We can then go through and simulate at negligible cost. So the cost of us doing the simulations is about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so we can run through multiple permutations, uh, so RV apex pacing or RV apex pacing with RVOT pacing, uh, biventricular pacing, biventricular pacing with RVOT, the list goes on. So we can look at all these different permutations for this individual patient. We can say which one of these is going to give us a nice synchronous activation for both the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and we can compare these and then use this to go forward for how to evaluate if this patient or this particular patient's anatomy uh, and the repair might be likely to respond to CRT. So this is a case study showing how we can use this technology uh, in, in the context uh, of congenital heart disease, but it's something we're, we're only just starting to work with the Brompton on. So 
our main body of work is looking at the adult population, and one of the areas we were interested uh, was in the guidelines. So we have the standard guidelines, which are for CRT that you have a reduced ejection fraction and you have a prolonged cure restoration. Um, however, if we look at the gender balance of some of the big trials which led to this inclusion criteria, there's quite a heavy male bias here, uh, and that this result may not be relevant for all, all people who are receiving the device. And so in particular, we know that women who have a shorter cure are more likely to respond if they have a shorter cure restoration, and that women with shorter cure restorations have an equal probability to respond as men with longer cure restorations. And these are nice studies, but the question that, that our cardiologists came to us with was, what's an absolute number? How can I change the cure restoration numbers that I have uh, for the general population? Can I tune those to my female patients in a better way? How could I adjust those? So that was what we wanted to see if we could do with our simulations to give a first estimate of how we might want to calibrate these cure restoration inclusion criteria uh, for female patients. So we have our virtual cohort, and our, our cohort has the same problem that it's biased as, as with everyone else. We have 11 female patients out of the 50, um, but we do separate them into two groups. And what we did was we looked at patients with left, we looked at uh, two different uh, activation pathologies, left bundle branch block and non-left bundle branch block. And we said, what if we tuned the conduction properties for each of these patients so that they match different cure restoration thresholds? So 120, 130, or 150 milliseconds. So that then gave us our, uh, that then gave us our conduction velocity numbers with, if you have left bundle branch block and you have a conduction velocity of 60 centimeters per second, you will have about a cure risk of 130. Whereas if you don't have left bundle branch block, you need a conduction velocity of 45 uh, centimeters per second uh, to have the same cure risk duration. So we could then take these same pathologies and these same tissue properties and propagate those into the female hearts and see what the change in cure restoration was. And that allowed us to give us an estimate of what the effect of anatomy might be on the difference in cure restoration for male and female patients. And so while I appreciate and I'm fully aware that the people will tell me uh, that there are many differences uh, or many factors that affect the QRS and that there are many differences between males and females, if we're looking at the effect of anatomy alone, this tends to have about a 10, 10 millisecond decrease, and these are patients who might be able to benefit who can't, currently aren't receiving any therapy. So another question we have is working out where to pace, and uh, we have our kind of standard activation pattern here where we might have a left bundle branch block we have activation of septum, and we're going to have a late activated region in the lateral wall. So we know that pacing in late activated regions which have no scar are likely to improve response. So we're going to be pacing in this region here, and that's a pretty simple case. But we also know that if we pace near scar, then that's likely to increase the arrhythmogenic risk for our patients with CRT. And so if we have our lateral wall, this region here then becomes a region which is late activated, but is also close to scar. So that then comes up with the problem if I'm pacing in the late activated region, but I'm not pacing to SCAR, what is the balance between those where I'm not going to have my arrhythmogenic risk, but I can still pace in a late activated region? So we were able to make uh, mathematical models of hearts where we could have an infarct region and we could calculate isochrones, which give us different distances away from that SCAR, and we look at pacing at those different distances away from that SCAR to say, how close do you have to be to the SCAR before you're going to increase your arrhythmogenic risk? So again, we went through the process of making a virtual cohort. We were able to get MRIs with late enhancement, where the red regions represent the border zone, the uh, dark regions represent the kind of chronic infarct scar, and these are taken from CRT or ischemic CRT patients. And so we also know that if you increase repolarization gradients in any ectopic beats, which are likely to happen in the border zone, are more likely to induce an arrhythmia. And so we were looking to try and see how, if we had these high repolarization gradient regions, in close vicinity of SCAR and how they might alter as we move the pacing location. So we can do a simulation where we put a pacing lead which is 0.2 centimetres from the SCAR and we have these large high gradient repolarization regions which are very close to the SCAR within this kind of one centimetre region here which we took to be a, an indication of arrhythmia risk. And as you move your electrode away, so too do these high repolarization gradients associated with that activation move away from where the SCAR is located. And so we could then plot for our 24 patients as we paced at different distances from the scar that we saw a drop off at about 2.5 to 4.5 centimetres. So we were saying that, that this gives us an estimate, at least as a beginning point, uh, for saying that we shouldn't be pacing within about 3.5 centimetres of scar if we want to reduce that arrhythmogenic risk based on the electrophysiology of these patients. So again, this is not saying this is an absolute truth, but it provides us a number that is then testable as opposed to being a qualitative descriptor. And so the last thing that we want to talk about was how we can use our uh, models and image processing to work out where to pace patients. 
So we start off our process with our patients receive a cardiac CT. This is our phantom head, which is amusing, uh, that they're, they're analyzing here. We then bring that into a uh, Siemens system, which we've also added our own software onto, which allows us to make a planning program. We then have the patient come in, we register the results in that planning program with the fluoroscopy, and then that uh, image from the planning program gets overlaid on top of the fluoroscopy in real time during the procedure so that the cardiologist know where, knows where to pace. So the process for doing this is we use feature tracking from retrospective gated cardiac CT, which then allows us to characterize what the strain is across the uh, LV endocardial wall. And then we can make a standard AHA map with the different strain patterns to characterize where the latest region to contract is located. And so although this is a relatively uh, trivial image to produce, it turns out that when you have a, a cardiac CT, which is incredibly high resolution, uh, that it takes quite a lot of work to be able to uh, do that feature tracking but my, my postdoc would want me to say that. Uh, the other thing we do is with cardiac CT, and again, if people have answers to this, I'm very happy to find out. We have had not a lot of luck in using late enhancement uh, in our cardiac CT to identify where SCAR is. It's not been reliable, but we have been able to do perfusion CT imaging. So this is our perfusion CT image where we have a, a low perfusion region here. This is the MRI from the patient that we had previously before they had their device implanted, and we have a, a late enhancement region here. Uh, correspond to the same AHA segments. So that gives us some confidence that our uh, late perfu low perfusion regions giving us an idea where an impact is and that we can use that as part of the workflow uh, from CT alone. Then what we do is we make our mathematical model where we can take our anatomy derived from the cardiac CT combined with the electrophysiology from the ECG. We then make our rule-based five model and we have a rule-based electrophysiology model where we add in a fast endocardial conduction layer we can then segment out the coronary uh, anatomy, coronary sinus, so that we can know where we might have access to in this particular patient. And in fairness, we can now do this for both endocardial, uh, using the EBR WIC system, as well as epicardial pacing devices, so this is less and less important. We can do our simulations of our activation pattern to work out where the last activating region is, and then we can then provide that uh, as an indicator to the cardiologist, uh, which we can then again put on the AHA segment. So for each of these patients, they come and they have their CT. Uh, our shortest case that we've had to do was in 24 hours because of NHS wait time restrictions and the patient needed to be seen. Uh, so we can put all this together in about 24 hours and we have a conversation with the cardiologist and we say the evidence for where not to pace based on the perfusion imaging, the region where to pace based on the latest contraction and the where to pace based on the simulations of electrophysiology. We put all those together and that we then combine to create a map which gives a target of where we would like to put uh, the pacing device. And then we can project that on uh, within the, from the CT imaging and then we can bring that information into the fluoroscopy in real time. So as the cardiologist will be moving the C, C arm, so too will the, uh, uh, the, the targets be updated uh, dynamically so that they can kind of track those. So this is the, the, the current uh, clinical study that we're working on uh, for uh, both epicardial pacing and endocardial pacing using the EBR WIX device. So what I hope I've shown is that, that we have these kind of computational models and that they provide a way where you can link some of the basic physiology that you might have from mouse models or animal models or, or proteomics through uh, to organ scale observations. That it's a way where you can start to test new therapies and, and apply new, new, new kind of hypotheses about how you might be able to treat a patient we can optimize therapies, that we might be able to use models to calibrate our inclusion criteria or indications to different patient groups, and that uh, it provides a, a framework where we can integrate uh, a lot of data from different imaging modalities and put that all together uh, to guide therapy.